Welcome to Edinburgh, Scotland. This morning we're outside of the Royal Observatory Edinburgh with its famous green copper domes. When we go inside, we'll speak to the staff and get a tour of the observatory, talk about the astronomy outreach and the ongoing science that goes on here, and then learn about the history of this amazing institution. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hey, hello, hi, and welcome to episode seven of KPO's European Astronomy Tour. Today we'll be visiting the Royal Observatory Edinburgh here on Blackford Hill in the old city of Edinburgh, Scotland. This observatory was built and established in April 1896 when two telescopes were moved from other installations and put here in this new observatory. The first was a 15-inch refractor placed in the East Dome and a 24-inch reflector established in the West Dome. In addition to these two scopes, an 18.5-inch transit circle was housed in a separate building further west. The site is currently owned by the Science and Technology Facilities Council, which is a UK government body that carries out civil research in science and engineering. It's also the home of the UK Astronomy Technology Centre, which develops major instrumentation projects in support of UK and international astronomy. This last organisation was formed in 1998 from the Technology Departments of the Royal Observatory Edinburgh and the Royal Greenwich Observatory Cambridge. We learned about some of this history a couple episodes ago in our European Astronomy Tour. The ATC is involved in many of the great observatories around the world. You may recognize the names of a few of these, such as the Gemini Observatory in Mauna Kea, the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope on Mauna Kea, Hawaii, also known as the UKIRT, the Isaac Newton Group on La Palma in the Canary Islands, the European Southern Observatory, and the future James Webb Space Telescope. In addition to developing all this great astronomy technology, the observatory carries out astronomical research and university teaching for design, project management, and construction of instruments and telescopes for astronomical observatories, and teacher training in astronomy and outreach to the public. Well, next up is our interview with Dr. William Taylor, who's one of the project scientists at the UK Astronomy Technology Center. He'll be telling us about all this great science and excellent astronomy outreach that goes on at this historic astronomy venue. We'll meet him right after this break. We're here in the Crawford Integration Lab of the Royal Observatory Edinburgh. We're very lucky to be with Dr. William Taylor. Dr. Taylor is a project scientist at the UK Astronomy Technology Center. Welcome to our show today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great to be here. So I'm really interested to find out about all this incredible technology that you all are doing here and how you contribute to the different uh, observatories around the world. Can you tell us some of the projects that are going on? Yes, certainly. So we've had a long history of being involved in projects away from Edinburgh. Unfortunately, um, as you you're seeing today, Edinburgh is not the best place for astronomy. Right. It's, it's a little <laughs> bit wet, it's often cloudy. Um, and so for a long time, this site particularly has started to look at other places. Mm -hmm. um, and in the past that meant actually a lot of work in Hawaii. So uh, we, were, yeah. we were involved in operating, running some of the telescopes in Hawaii mm -hmm. sort of from here. So there were staff from here got shipped out there right. um, and spent, spent a few years living out on the mountain and enjoying the nice life in Hawaii. Right. Um, that's slightly changed now that the UK's pulled back on its involvement from Hawaii, but we're involved mm -hmm. in other projects are particularly involved with the European Southern Observatory, so mm -hmm. ESO. Um, yeah. We're building a lot of bits of quick kit for them. Mm -hmm. um, and also for other things like space-based missions, JWST we've been involved with, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously very exciting. But equally, other things like software for sort of, uh, ground-based uh, right. radio telescopes and things mm -hmm. of that nature. And La Palma, that's the... That's La Palma the as well, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so you should be right. saying La Palma, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah indeed, no, so in, in, involved in building bits of kit for that. I mean, often when you think about what we do here, it's, it's generally building the cameras which go on the back of the mm -hmm. telescopes. Right. I mean, I was, always say that the way I always think about um, instrumentation for astronomy is, is, is the inverse of an SLR camera. Mm -hmm. So an SLR camera, you, you spend all your money on the camera and then you get different lenses. Sure. In astronomy, we spend all our money on the lens, which is our telescope, <laughs> and then we can just stick new cameras on the back. Right. Um, and, and so we're building those cameras, generally. That's, right, right. That's building those bits of kit you just bolt on. Um, sure, sure. And, and that's what this, this incredible this, facility is. This beast has. of a thing, yeah, yeah. is, is, is for, for testing those things. You can imagine that when you, when you bolt something on the back of the telescope, 
throughout the course of the night, the telescope is looking in different directions, and the thing is Balance. moving different di upside down, mm -hmm. round, it has to rotate potentially, depending on where it is mounted on the telescope. Yeah. And so all, this allows us to, to build the thing here, mm -hmm. vault it on that bit, um, and then we can, you can see where the kind of silver section is, that rotates, right. and then the blue arms kind of can come round, so we can simulate any yeah. orientation you might get. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's quite a, uh, it's a very important facility, because it's fine to build something which works here, right. and then you do that, and you find that it doesn't work. It doesn't so well. work anymore. Particularly the Delta Precision, you know, often we, we've been doing things with, well, lots of different things, but we've got something like a, a mirror which has to be pushed into the beam, yeah. and it has to be very, very precisely aligned. Um, right. And something like that, if you tip that upside down, mm -hmm. it can't move by even a few microns yeah. too much. I, I'm a project manager in real life, so I, I can imagine that the integration and the testing it's, process must be incredible. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's something else we've kind of doing a lot of here is that um, because we actually on site here, we have a lot of engineers who are full time building equipment. So they're not they're not academic researchers who also have to balance a, right. a research career. They're all they, they're just engineers and also with that project managers and systems sure. engineers because these projects are now so complex. They're such yeah. you know, vastly sort of uh, detailed things with all these different movements, different types of optics, electronics to worry about sure. that we have to have people who are purely just stepping back and managing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, also, they're quite expensive. So. I, I, would, I wish this were near Florida. I would love to be involved with this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun place to work. Okay. It really is. So you had, you had mentioned that, you know, that, that this obviously supports um, research and astronomy. There's a lot of that that's going on here as well. Yeah, yes, yeah. very much. Um, so the site has got, um, the, so to say, this group of engineers who are, who are doing a lot of the building and stuff, but equally in that direction, um, in the lesser track of the older building, mm -hmm. there's, um, there's some of the, a lot of the university staff yeah. who, who are... Um, members of Edinburgh University, and they're what you might think of more as traditional mm -hmm. astronomy researchers. Right. They're, they're looking at all manner of things, particularly, we're particularly strong on cosmology here, yeah. so looking at the large scale structure of the universe, mm -hmm. um, but also it, there's people looking at exoplanets, there's people looking at you know, nearby nebula, whatever, wherever it might be. Sure. Um, and so, to some degree, we, we kind of work together, so in the, in the best possible sense, they have an interesting scientific question. Yeah. They, they need a new piece of kit to answer that question. They come to us and sure. we help to build it. Exactly. Um, which is That's your requirements, important. your, your requirements e exactly, collection. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so my role is kind of, I'm sort of that interface point. So I'm actually a researcher. Yeah. Um, but I, I work, generally I spend most of my days working with the engineers okay. as that kind of liaison between, to make mm -hmm. sure what they build will do the science which those guys want. Yep, um, I, I understand so, that role. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, so, uh, so you have to balance out the incredible astronomy uh, research, and I know you do a lot of uh, astronomy outreach here as well. Yes, yeah. yeah. So that's something else we're very keen to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, actually I think it's, we're doing, generally astronomy has got a very high profile in the UK at the yes. moment, which is fantastic. Which is great, yeah. Um, and so we're very keen to support that as much as we can. We do it through having people come to visit us. Mm -hmm. um, so we have uh, school groups who come in regularly. We have members of the public coming in on Friday nights. They can use some of our smaller telescopes to right. do a bit of observing. Oh, well, actually, that's not true, because generally it's cloudy, so <laughs> they can't. But if it was clear, they could do some astronomy. Right. Um, but then the other thing we're, we're particularly good on is doing things like trying to develop activities to be used in schools for teachers um, and, and sort of that making resources for other people to do the outreach with. So mm -hmm. I think that's quite a big part yeah. of it. And I think I saw you had a good uh, event here for the Mercury Transit a while back. Yes, yeah, yeah we did, yes. Yeah. So we got out one of the telescopes and it was a beautifully clear day. Um, yeah. So it was great. Um, and it was really nice actually because it was a large conference on um, in the in, in the university, right. uh, lots of people visiting, lots mm -hmm. of astronomers from all over the world visiting, and so in their lunch break, we were just so right, come do some real astronomy. Right. Let's okay. <laughs> forget about all that deep space stuff you're doing. Come and look at actual planet passing in front sure. of a star. Sure, sure, um, which, yeah. which is and brilliant. and the, the the public loves that. I mean, when when I show, and when we happen to have Saturn in a good position, Saturn just wows people. You know, it's it's. Yeah. Um, but I would think seeing Mercury pass across the oh, disk was yes, probably it incredible. was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and okay. it was so crisp actually. The um, because we were a bit worried, there were a couple of sunspots at the same time. Yeah. Um, and we were saying, oh, you know, will you be able to see the difference? And it was immediate, you know, how sunspots kind of got frilly edges. It's right. a bit kind of right, right, misshapen, right. whereas this is a perfect black circle. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it was great. Yeah. It was really but we, I think we have one of Venus coming up in the next few years, so. Yeah. Yeah, not yes, exactly, much, but yeah, I, I, that's bigger disk. <laughs> yeah, 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 indeed. Uh, we tried to see the Venus one here. Um, I went with a group of school children up to the top of the hill in the middle of Edinburgh mm -hmm. at 4.30 in the morning to go and watch this. Uh, <laughs> and it was cloudy. Yeah. <laughs> but they still all came. They all, they, all, they all made the trek, which was good. <laughs> okay, well, I'm jumping around a little bit, but um, going back to research, I understand your specialty is massive stars and the study of that. Yes. Yes. Um, so I, 
I look at um, systems which are way bigger than our, our own sun, mm -hmm. um, tens of times the mass of our sun. Um, and these are the sort of systems which, when they die, will will result in sort of more exciting supernova. Right. Um, so that's kind of where the transition is. The stars, will, our own sun, will die as a planetary nebula, so it just kind of yeah. And that's pieces. that's exactly where I was going. I mean, yeah. in in our um, in my star hopping show, we we talk about. Uh, the different types of planetary nebula, and where we're finding them. Uh, you know, you, you have regular yeah, planetary. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have regular planetaries, and then you have supernova. When, when, what's the tipping point? When do you go between a when a, when the star, you know, expels its gas? You go from a planetary to a supernova. So it, it depends on the mass of the starting star. So it's about eight solar masses. It's kind of the the, mm -hmm. the point at which the star will, rather than fall to pieces mm -hmm. into a planetary nebula, right. will go through a more cataclysmic. Moment of explosion, mm -hmm. um, which which is because that, that that sort of mass influences the dynamics going on in the in the core of the star right. and the the different elements which will be um, fused in right. the core. So the larger the star, the, the heavier the element. So mm -hmm. it changes how the star will eventually die. Right. Um, and so, the, but the funny thing is, the the process is quite similar. But some of the stars and some of the stars I've been looking at have got. Um, strange structure around them which look very like planetary nebula right. but they're massive stars which mm -hmm. will explode a supernova in time right but they've got similar you know the kind of the, the hourglass mm -hmm. shaped these kind of yes yeah, like it's, it's starting to yeah they, they've, they've, some of them have there's some of the particular group called lbv so luminous blue variables mm -hmm. which appear to um, they change considerably in brightness right but they also appear to have some of them seem to have these bigger sort of eruptive events where they just Shrug off a few solar masses of right. material into into a ring or into. Okay. So, Eta Carina is a famous one. Sure, yeah. Obviously, the homunculus. Amazing yeah. structures <laughs> around them. But there seems to be quite a lot of things like that. And mm -hmm. again, why they they've got these asymmetries as right. the planetary nebula have. The planetary nebula are right. horribly complex. Cat's eye nebula, and then, then you have beautiful symmetric ones like the ring or yes. the dumbbell or things like yeah. that. It's very odd. I really appreciate your time. Um, been super informative. When uh, where can our viewers find out more about you and the and the observatory? So if you have a look at our, our, our website, then mm -hmm. there's lots of information about sort of things we're mm -hmm. doing. So you'll see that our website immediately sort of splits into different things. You've got the visitor center and right. all the excellent stuff they're doing. Mm -hmm. Then there's the university group, and you can find out about the research we're doing. And then there's us. Okay. Um, so also we're we're part. Actually, our website's built because we're part of a broader thing called STFC, which mm -hmm. is a, a research council of the UK. Right. Um, and so there's in some ways there's more detail about what we do on on their websites. Okay. Um, but yeah. All right. Well, that's all I had for you. Is there anything more you want to tell us about any of the other great stuff going on? here or did I miss anything or <laughs> I think we've covered quite a lot okay. so uh, pleasure pleasure okay, talking to you. Very good, Cheers. very good. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. William Taylor. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, that was really excellent. So in our next segment, we have another amazing guest. We're going to talk with Dr. Andy Lawrence, who's the Regis Professor of Astronomy at the University of Edinburgh and a previous head of the Institute for Astronomy here. He'll give us some historic background of the Royal Observatory Edinburgh and tell us about the different optical instruments that have been here. We'll also get an up-close and personal look at the 36-inch Grubb Parsons Cassegrain Telescope in the Visitor Center. We'll check all this out right after this. Well, here we are in the Royal Observatory Edinburgh's Visitor Center, actually in one of the observatory domes, and we're extremely privileged to have with us today one of the most respected and renowned astronomers in the UK, Dr. Andy Lawrence. Dr. Lawrence is the Regis Professor of Astronomy since 1994 at the University of Edinburgh Institute for Astronomy, which he also headed up from 1994 to 2003. He also worked at the Royal Observatory Greenwich in Sussex uh, that we saw a few, uh, few days ago in the early 80s, where he was an optical infrared astronomer. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. And what we'd like to welcome to the show, Dr. Andy Lawrence. Glad to be here. Mm -hmm. So that was actually a lot of uh, feathers in your cap that I didn't actually mention. Uh, one of the main things is the Regis Professor of Astronomy. Can you explain to our viewers what that means? It, well, Regis just means connected with, with the crown. So uh, okay. what, what it means is that somewhere way back in history, uh, in this case about 1785, mm -hmm. uh, the British crown gave the university some money which set up the chair. Mm -hmm. Okay, So it's named a Regis chair. So it, there's no connection with royalty now. Oh, okay. okay. And it's not like being astronomer royal, there are no duties. Right. It's just a chair that was funded by the crown. There are lots of different subjects around the UK. There is about 200. There's a, there's a Regis professor of botany, a Regis yeah. professor of law. Uh -huh. you know. There's about 200 of them over the UK okay. as, as a whole. 
Okay, so when I was doing my research for, the, for this interview, um, I saw a lot of really interesting things that caught my eye. One of them was the Wide Field Astronomy Unit that you've been working on. Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yeah, so that, that unit started in 1999, but the origins of it go a lot further back. Right. Um, yeah, this is where this nice artifact here comes okay. in. <laughs> Something that the observatory did um, from the 1970s onwards, mm -hmm. it was part of a major effort around the world mapping the sky, right. making atlases of the mm -hmm. sky. There were two Schmidt telescopes, uh, one in the north in California, the Palomar Schmidt, right. and one in the south, the UK Schmidt telescope right. in Australia. Australia. Okay. So here in Edinburgh was the kind of HQ for the UK Schmidt. Mm -hmm. So the telescope was down there in Australia. Mm -hmm. So it took the plates, they got shipped back here, uh, and then here we made lots of copies of them. So there's one here on the light table, mm -hmm. okay, so, and um, this is about six degrees across, so right. 12 moons across. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need about 800 of those around the sky to yeah. paint the whole sky. Lots and lots of data. And what we did here, we had people who um, made lots of copies of these, uh, and complete sets went off to uh, other uh, observatories, university departments, right. uh, for people to, to do their mm -hmm. research. Right. So that was going on until the mid-1990s, but starting from the 1990s, what we were doing was uh, scanning them. Yeah. Okay, in the modern, so they, they were digitized. Mm -hmm. uh, now all of this data is, is, is on the web, you can go and get it. Right. Okay? Uh, and that's how astronomers do their research now, of mm -hmm. course. But as, again, as of the late 1990s, we knew that the new thing was not just photographic plates like this and digitizing them, right. but digital detectors. CCDs, infrared cameras, mm -hmm. uh, multi-object spectrographs. Sure. Uh, so we could see there was a need for uh, a specialist unit yeah. that would uh, uh, be, be both a survey center and uh, a, a, a data center. Right, and to provide yeah. some standards to communicate with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. so now we'd, um, we have uh, infrared sky surveys here, UKIDS, VISTA, we have uh, the, the uh, Gaia data here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're hoping in a little while to have the, uh, a, 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 a copy of the data from the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. That's right. the big thing of the future. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. But that's what we do, mapping the sky. Sure. Okay. Okay. So all this, all this huge data is, needs to be, you know, basically put together and have a way to communicate it, and that's the virtual observatory project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, that started in the early 2000s. It's still very active now. Mm -hmm. um, so if you imagine scanning a plate like this and turning it into digital data. Right. Uh, it's a lot of data. Right. Okay. And then when you repeat it at different wavelengths, and then you do an infrared survey, an X-ray survey. Uh, then you have two problems. Firstly, it's a hell of a lot of data. Yeah, different right? versions of the same data too. Yeah, yeah. and also um, those data sets are actually in different uh, cities around the world. Mm -hmm. Right, the infrared data's here, the X-ray data's in in Leicester or or Boston, Mass. Right, you know, and it, it, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes an internet problem. If you're sitting there at your desk, you want to pull data from different places. You can't move that much across yeah. the net. You need them all to. Um, to fit each other, so you right. can mix and match and play with them. Mm -hmm. So it's all about standardization. Okay. So there's a body called the International Virtual Observatory Alliance, which uh, was one of the people mm -hmm. uh, that set that up. Right. And we meet twice a year and argue. <laughs> <laughs> lots of argument, <laughs> lots of beers. Yeah, yeah. It's all very easy, apart from you can never get the Americans to agree with the French. That's 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 all. <laughs> <laughs> So with all your wonderful experience here and, and over the years, um, you've obviously know all about the history of this area and, and, um, and the ROE and how that works with the Greenwich Observatory. And, and I know you were, you were at Hersmansu originally. I was, yes. 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 Um, and in my resource to this, I, I was just fascinated by all the events that occurred in the 80s and 90s. Um, could mm. you give us some background on that since you were there? And Oh, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, quite scary. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so historically, there were uh, two Royal Observatories in, right. in Britain, the Royal Greenwich Observatory at the Royal Observatory Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. uh, through most of um, history, the Royal Greenwich Observatory was, was uh, bigger and, and more important. Yeah. Um, but through the 20th century, that started changing, and a lot of activity was here in Edinburgh, yeah. and they were pretty much equal size and importance. Mm -hmm. Then what happened was that uh, from the 60s and 70s onwards, um, doing observations from Edinburgh or from Greenwich is obviously nonsense. Right. And we started building telescopes on top of big mountains mm -hmm. you know, and remote islands. 
in Hawaii, Australia, sure. mm -hmm. Canaries, Chile, yeah. Chile and, mm -hmm. and so on. So once those beautiful new observatories were working, uh, then you ask yourself, hmm, so why do I need these big places in Greenwich and Edinburgh? The mm -hmm. actions there on those mountains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was clear that um, uh, at, at most you needed maybe one UK HQ, not right. two. Mm -hmm. And actually it had to be a lot smaller. Right. And everybody agreed the key thing was actually what we needed in the UK uh, was the ability, was technology. Right. The, uh, a central institute that would uh, take care of building instruments, developing new technology. Right. So that was the idea of the UK Astronomy Technology Centre. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the scary thing, um, I'm cutting a long story short here. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is a long story. But, uh, yes, and uh, yeah, but anyway, but this, during the 1990s, you know, the, 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 the bullet was bit, as it were, yeah. and basically the government thought, well, no, we've got to do this. So the idea was to close down mm -hmm. the existing um, RGO and ROE right. and create this new UK Astronomy Technology Centre. Right. There was a long, difficult political battle. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to wait till a few more people retire to find out what really happened. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay yeah. but, That's fair. <laughs> uh, but the bottom line is that um, uh, the RGO, the Astronomy Technology Centre was built here in Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we re and, and the RGO moved back to Greenwich. Mm -hmm. So it's now a, a very big, important place again, but, right. but in, um, in outreach and history and you know, public mm -hmm. uh, facing stuff rather than as a research center. Right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah, yeah so we here, were there, it's a fantastic place. Yeah, it is, yeah. It is mm -hmm. and back in, back in Greenwich, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to Hurstman Right. Where, where, I, where I did work. As, mm -hmm. as, as, as we you, were there as too. We, yeah. went, we went a couple of days down there, I saw those tall It's, it's lovely in Sussex, mm -hmm. but yeah. quite sleepy. No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, so we built the Astronomy Technology Centre here, yeah. uh, but also the, the university side that I work for, you know, the research, the teaching, was just, it's just all on the same site. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes this place kind of cool, because okay. we have the technology, we have the history, we have science, cosmology, you know, right. exoplanets, it's all here. Uh, very good. Um, so what were the original scopes that were in here um, that they originally <clears throat> had? And so um, when the observatory moved from Carlton Hill to here, mm -hmm. Um, there was a 15-inch telescope. I think, I think I'm a bit confused actually whether that was in this dome or the other okay. one. Uh, <laughs> but there was, that was the workhorse for a while. Okay. And then in 1928, as you can see here on the, on the pier here, yeah. this was the big new exciting telescope. Right. So the, 1928, this was state-of-the-art. Yeah, it's so, huge for that time. Yeah, 36-inch uh, reflector. Mm -hmm. um, and what it, so, so, so the primary mirror is here. Uh, there's a secondary up the top there, so the line comes, oops, sorry, <laughs> so down here, up the secondary, back down through, through a hole, so it's a category focus. Right. And where now this kind of empty shell is now, uh, the real workhorse instrument here mm -hmm. was a, a spectrograph. Yeah. Um, built by Adam Hilger, I think. Okay. Uh, the telescope was built by Grub Parsons in mm -hmm. Newcastle, um, and that company doesn't exist anymore, very yeah, sad. Yeah. Well, we saw that down in the, at Hearst Monsu, a lot of the scopes down there have had the same name, yeah. same company, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the same thing in, in Greenwich, the one there, so. So, uh, this took some plates, but mostly it was for spectroscopy, okay. uh, 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 I think. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was doing productive work until the early 1970s, okay. and then eventually just got kind of tied down. So now it's a museum piece. <laughs> So I understand you've recently published a, uh, a astronomy textbook for it was astronomy measurement that's out mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. Where can people find that? Uh, well, uh, two ways. So one, well, three. Mm -hmm. uh, number one is go to your library. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's um, it's published by Springer. Mm -hmm. You can get it in you know, Amazon, whatever as right, usual. Right. You'll find it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. But if you're uh, any kind of student or university staff, mm -hmm. you almost certainly you'll have an account with Springer. Mm -hmm. You go to Springer Link, mm -hmm. you can get the PDF for free oh, okay. or buy a softback copy for $25. Okay, and what's the uh, title of that? Uh, it's called Astronomical Measurement, uh, mm -hmm. a Concise Guide. Okay. It's, it is nice and short. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very good. Okay, well this has been an incredible opportunity. I know, I know you had some other things you wanted to mention. What are some other activities that you're doing right now? Well, uh, one of the things I'm most excited about, that uh, it's, a, it's a, a teaching come public outreach kind of activity 
Uh, we run a, a, a MOOC here, a massive open online course. Okay. <laughs> it's with the, with the Coursera platform. Uh, it's called uh, AstroTech, the science and technology behind astronomical discovery. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's um, uh, run by myself and Catherine Haymans. Okay. And so it, it, uh, it's a six-week course on Coursera. Uh, you can join it for free or you can do a certificated version for $25. Okay. Um, it's um, it's it's a lot easier than some, <laughs> than some of the MOOCs I've seen. It, okay. We tried to make it so that anybody can, can, can do it. Okay. So it's run uh, twice and thousands of students all over the world sort of uh, did it. It was very exciting. Okay. Um, and we're just in the middle of editing it for a, a, a new version. Uh, which should be launched a few weeks from, okay. from, from now. So. Okay, well, where can people find that? So you go to the web and you search www.courseera, that's course -E -R -A okay. dot org, mm -hmm. and they're a very cool setup. So there are courses from all sorts of universities and all sorts of topics. So you can learn about psychology, computer programming, astronomy, yeah. Buddhism. What, that you know, sounds great. It's, it is. It's great. And I've, I've taken a lot of those courses too. Okay. You know, so, but um, uh, yeah, so go okay. to it. All righty. So I know that, um, the, you know, the, the professional scientists definitely have a creative side and I understand you'd like to, you've done some acting in the past? <laughs> yeah. Well, long, yes, a long <laughs> Something time. Something you'd like to do more of. A long time. A long time ago. Mm -hmm. Well, no, the actual acting, no, I haven't done that for a very long time. Okay. But, it's, but it is true. I don't know how you found that out. Yeah, but it's, it's, on, it's, it's on your page. <laughs> is it? Oh, okay. Right. That's true that somewhere way in the past, when I was a student, I did okay. the, all the Amdram. Um, I think that experience uh, was good mm -hmm. because uh, lecturing is a bit like acting. Yes. You know? So you do, you do, you do learn to... Or this kind of thing, yeah, right? <laughs> Look people in the eye <laughs> and, and speak loud. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's as simple as that. Very useful. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, very good. I really appreciate your time and uh, thank you so much for speaking with us. And I hope you all enjoyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Andy Lawrence. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I'm completely blown away after that incredible experience. I really hope you enjoyed it. So here in KPO's European Astronomy Tour, we've actually been able to bridge the historic events between the Royal Observatory Greenwich and the Royal Observatory Edinburgh. We've learned about the ongoing vigorous activities being undertaken here. They're really moving modern astronomy forward in the research and development of astronomy technology being implemented in major observatories around the world. I again want to thank Dr. William Taylor and Dr. Andy Lawrence for joining us today and sharing with us their expertise and insight into modern astronomy. I also want to thank Dr. Amy Tyndall for working with me to get these interviews all set up. It's been a great visit here at the Royal Observatory Edinburgh. So you can see the episode notes at kpobservatory.org forward slash EAT07, where you can find our itinerary and publication schedule for the rest of the trip. As I've mentioned, throughout this tour, I'll be checking the site and YouTube for any comments or questions you might have, so feel free to ask away. In next week's episode on the European Astronomy Tour, we're going to experience another incredible piece of astronomy history. We're going to visit the famous Burr Castle and see the Leviathan of Parsonstown, the Earl of Ross's 72-inch reflecting telescope. This was the scope used to discover the Whirlpool Nebula and to name the Crab Nebula. It'll be another great episode. Until then, happy travels in clear skies, and we'll see you next time on KPO's European Astronomy Tour.